Hey everyone, Richard Taylor here. We're going to be talking about NAB today with Gary Adcock. If you want to be notified of Final Cut Pro and NAB news, I'm going to be broadcasting from there live a lot of different times as I'm going around the convention center and some events behind the scenes thing kind of things. It's not going to be so much it's going to be some interviews. I have some interviews scheduled, that's for sure. But it's more going to be, I like doing behind the scenes kinds of things. So if you want to be notified, subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's the best place. That's the best place to actually subscribe and be notified. Just click the notification. Isn't that the way it works? It's actually notification, some kind of a bell or something that you click on. There we go. And you'll be notified when we go live because I'm going to be doing a lot of times. I'm going to be on the convention center floor sometimes. I'm going to be at parties sometimes. It's going to start on Sunday. I'll be there on Sunday and we'll start the actual, or the actual reporting. Uh, it's more behind the, like I said, behind the scenes kinds of things. So. Subscribe to my channel, youtube.com, Richard Taylor TV, and then you will be notified as soon as I go live. If you have any questions, post them there in the chat. And as I said, I'll be seeing you guys in Las Vegas. Are Richard? Yes, I am. Hi, Richard. Hey, uh, Thank you very much. Hey everyone, welcome to Final Cut Pro Radio TV Live. And I have a very special guest today. We're going to be talking about NAB. We're going to be talking about gadgets. We're going to be talking about all kinds of technology because both of us are <coughs> technology geeks. Mr. Gary Adcock. How are you doing, <laughs> Thanks, Gary? Richard. I'm doing great, man. It's a beautiful day here in Chicago. It's like 65 degrees, the sun is shining, and we're ready for summer. You know, we we want we all want to go to Vegas to get out of the cold. Right, but it snowed <laughs> in Vegas. Yeah, last week. Yeah, so yeah it'll yeah. be it'll be ninety next week. So yeah, it'll be so, just like every, exactly everywhere else in the country. It's it's the same global warming that affects everybody everywhere else. It snowed it snowed in Vegas, and then when I was at the Creative Summit in Cupertino last year, it was smoky the whole week. Well, and I mean, look what's happened in D.C. I mean, you guys in D.C. have gotten hammered with snow this year. Yep, more than. I mean, record amounts. It's like, you know, you get six or seven inches of snow in D.C., the whole city shuts down. Yeah. I know. Yeah. There. <laughs> it, it, literally, that happened back in the 90s when Mayor couple, Barry was in charge of everything. They they had a snow and they hadn't kept their equipment up and the city was shut down for like days. They had no no equipment to plow anything. I remember that because I was working, doing woodworking in those days down in D.C. And we couldn't get to the places to, to go to work. Well, it, it, well, it's also, you know, you don't think about that, but it's also, I mean, as far south as Georgia has gotten snow this year. And you look at northern Florida and, and those kind of places that have been hit with that kind of weather and you really start to worry about it. But but it's also, I mean, you look at the flooding in the Midwest and Nebraska and Iowa and places that are, are so far inland and so far from the ocean. We have to think about this as, as, as a changing global economy. Yep, so absolutely. It's not, tech, it's not technology, but it affects all of us and we have to think about it. So... We're going to be talking about all kinds of stuff today, but we'll start with when we were off the air a minute ago, we were talking about the wireless situation and how many devices did you say you have in your house that are on the 2.4, 2.5 gigahertz? Oh, I, I have literally hundreds. Uh, I mean, if people don't think about everything they own, my coffee maker has a sensor on it. You know, the fob on my my car keys and my wife's car keys. So there's four right there. We both have, you know, uh, an alarm for our car keys. Um, it's the sensors for um, 
weather and, and security and everything else. It's the televisions we have that all have Bluetooth on them. I mean, it's it's five computers and six handheld devices and everything else that we have that all work on that same point, 2.4 gigahertz, 5 per gigahertz band around where microwaves are. And, and one of the sessions I'm doing at NAB is actually this wireless conundrum of how you deal with all these different kinds of technology that are all bleeding into each other as we work. Um, it, it's difficult, and particularly if we're starting to talk about transmitting video, and and you know we're going to get to the thing where we're going to start doing 4K and 8K wirelessly at some point in the future. You've got to think about those kind of things, and you've got to think about all the interference that's built in our lives. You know, it's not just the car, it's it's not just the you know the garage door opener. It's everything around us that has those kinds of technology built into them. 8K wireless? Well, I mean, I'm talking long time in the future. It's a that's a pipe dream right okay. now. But 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 it will be. I mean, you know, you look at what's being done with IP video, where they're already dealing with, you know, wireless control for AV sensors, AV, and a lot of projection systems in that. They're going to handle up to 4K now. Now we're talking about you know, the ability to do all of these wireless things. How do we control all the devices? So how, how do you see? I hear controversy all the time about I've been shooting 4K for for years since the GH4 came out. I started shooting 4K. And people say, well, you can't even see 4K technically. So, well, you know, I, I can. Uh, I, I, I may not be able to see it on that little tiny screen on the back of a GH4 or, right. or the camera, but I have monitors that have that. And, and it's interesting because one of the issues I was arguing with somebody else at earlier this week is, is that you can get a, a UHD, 3840, 2160 right. monitor. And, you know, they, they stop at about 17 or 18 inches. It's really hard to find anything smaller than that. And what we find out is, is that people have always started going to larger and larger monitors on set. You know, 24s, 32s are now common. I mean, I work with a 32-inch UHD HDR monitor on my desktop. You know, it's 1,000 nits. It's kind of hard to work at on, you know, typing at night. Right. It's, you know, right. staring into the sun. Sure. But, but I, I mean, but the monitors are there. And I think that people don't don't think about this. this it's been a gradual progression, but it's really a snowball after we got the digital, things are just going to start moving faster and faster. And I think the next step of that is actually IP video, which I think is going to be one of the big things that people hear about at the show this year. You know, being able to handle uh, video over Ethernet and connectivity between your devices, both AV and, and IO solutions uh, over Ethernet. And, and it's a new way to go because we've, we've been stuck in this proprietary world for so long. I think what's going to happen is, is that, that being able to do all this over Ethernet is going to change everything. Okay, so let's, let's talk about that for a minute. What are the advantages over the Ethernet versus what other protocol are you talking about? Thunderbolt? Well, three? I mean, right, well, no. I, well, we're talking SDI and HDMI. Okay. For, literally, literally, we're talking baseband coax cabling between two devices. Okay. Um, the, the, the biggest issue with the technology as it's been built is it's, it's, it's single-channel monodirectional. I mean, it's okay. one channel, one channel going one way. Okay. You don't really, you, you don't really turn normally get return feeds or things on a lot of systems, and and it's so everything is a one cable per device per stream, and when you think about the way that the internet is devised and the way IP has been handled, internet protocols have been handled from the beginning. It's one device sends out a signal to multiple different places. Or, you know, it's a server delivering to multiple clients. Well, isn't that what we're doing? Isn't that what video's always been about is delivering, you know, the broadcasters do that. They sure. broadcast in a single place, everybody receives it. Now we're getting to the point where rather than handling this as, you know, relatively short runs of cabling, why not treat it like security cameras or the way we do with Facebook or Instagram? Literally what we're doing now is the next generation of television. So it's and, and because we're transferring it over Internet protocol, the streaming technology, why not? Why don't we just handle the infrastructure that way, too, from monitors to devices to everything? And, and, and it's the next step in this, particularly for a lot of the broadcasters and facilities. I think it's going to be a big jump for them to be able to do this, because in the long run, you're going to be able to do it's scalable, you know, at a ridiculous level. You know, there's there's not really any level of control you can hold over enter and Ethernet. You know, you get 10 gig Ethernet and it'll do 700 megabytes a second. That's that's more than most people even understand. And if we get to those levels with the able, way be able to handle things, particularly when you have power over Ethernet, um, we have the ability to do with Ethernet devices what we've been able to do with USB and Thunderbolt and everything else. And that's an, an interesting change in the way we think about technology. 
You know, it's a, it's it's one Ethernet cable, you know, eight eight wires, sure. and a simple plug, an RJ45 plug that everybody understands. I've I've wired a whole like mess load of, of, of Ethernet cabling in my lifetime. I understand the routing, I understand everything else. There's some issues with it and it, and initially it's gonna cost more. But in the long run, I think it's going to be better for everybody because, gee, think about being able to walk in and plug in the back of your television set to it with an Ethernet cable. You know, not to try to figure out which cable goes sure. where. No. What does, or, or does my spit of cable, the right kind of spit of cable for audio, or right. did I get the video spit right. of cable, which is not going to work? Or, or, oh, gee, I have an HDMI cable, but it's too short. And now we don't have any of those things because it gives us location independence. Now, it is gives that, the ability. Go ahead. Is, is the Ethernet cable you're talking about, is that? Transmitting digital information, not analog, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, they're, they're they only hand digital, handle digital information now, so it's it's just and and it's Ethernet the way we've always worked at it. It's just being handled a little bit differently on the backside. Okay. Um, I, I mean, it's not any different than watching a 4K stream from Netflix. It's you know we, we we handle the proprietary protocol to be able to view it in real time and how it caches and delivers information. But the advantages of this, particularly with some of the changes in SMPTE, mean that. Um, we could have somebody controlling the audio for this webcast somewhere else in the world and being able to handle the audio, you know, audio insertions in real time, whether it's ads, language translations, real time graphics, all of that can be handled from a remote location. You no longer have to embed audio and video as a single signal. They become separate entities. And if you take that to the level, to another level above, you think about augmented reality, virtual reality, where we're literally being able to insert live data into a video stream based on the location you're at. And that's a, that's a fundamental change in the way everything's going to be in the future. Now, it's, it seems to me that this has been around for a while, though, right? I mean, it's it may be coming to be more popular with 10 gig ports and stuff on computers. Exactly. Well, I mean... If you ever went into a broadcast facility, um, you know, a sports facility, I did the Big Ten Network uh, with Adobe and and they're all all their machines were wired together over 10 gig Ethernet and they were handling all the data back and forth. And then it was picked up by a server, um, one, you know, produced by LDK, where they're uh, Tom, you know, where they're actually handling that kind of stuff. And you do a Grass Valley switcher and then seize the file and can be able to read it. So it's dealing in a file based system. Already, when you're talking about sports, when you're talking about news, when you're talking about graphics, that stuff is all pretty much file-based for for the information services now. Why not take that same level for cinematic or commercial production or anything else? And then, then eventually, it'll get down to small shops. You know, whether it's you know houses of worship or small industrial shops, right. or guys like you and I that are just one or two offs that handle it. But it's coming no matter what. You've been able to buy IP technology for a few years. Okay. I mean, it's been, it's been available from Blackmagic and AJA and Matrox. Right, for, right. You know, for, for, you know, AJA started doing it like five or six years ago, Blackmagic at the same time. And you you don't see it on the user end so much because it's been dedicated to the facilities. But that technology is coming home to us. So you think a one- and two-man shop will have Ethernet connectivity to local storage or just for servers okay. and stuff? I, I eventually it'll be all, all, all encompassing because okay. it'll be just easy to be able to do it. Um, I see the desktop in five years getting to the, you know, the, the getting to the lesser end on okay. five years. And again, it's going to be, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a Thunderbolt three cable that goes to something else. It's going to be a USB-C adapter. You know, it's going to be that kind of technology that we already have. It's just because of the extensibility and the ease of use uh, and a multi-user environment that Ethernet allows, we have all of that built into it. We just need to take advantage of it. So I know the Mac Pro has, I mean, the iMac Pro has 10 gig Ethernet ports and it might even be an option on the new Mac Mini that came out. I think it is. It is, yeah. yeah. Or, or you use a card and a Thunderbolt adapter. I mean, I've done it with my Phantom cameras have always had 10 gig connectivity and did 10 gig over copper with a, an external card for that reason. So there's always been the way to do it. There's a lot of third party adapters that allow that. Um, uh, there's 10 gig adapters, even 40 gig adapters, um, 40 gig uh, ethernet adapters from guys like Addo and Promise and some of the other companies. So the technology is already there. We just haven't seen it yet. Right, so I, when last time you were on Final Cut Pro Radio, it's been a while. Um, we talked about what you expect in the in the Mac Pro, the new Mac 2019 Mac Pro. Has has your idea changed about that? 
what you no, expect? No. Uh, it still needs to be, you know, upgradable. It needs to be um, uh, modifiable. It needs to be a machine where we can plug and play. I mean, there's some, there's been a bunch of Lego analogies over it. I want right. to buy which I think, which is a great idea, um, and, and not that far off from what we've done. The problem you run in with those Lego kind of analogies is the connectors to be able to connect at that bandwidth are not inexpensive. They they cost a lot of money, and and that would drive up the price considerably when. When you let's be honest with it, these machines are built to be used for two or three years at a time. You know, they don't build computers to have five year, 10 year lifespans anymore. They're not refrigerators. No, no, <laughs> I, that's computer true. Is not a refrigerator. That's anymore. true. So, and and we, we got into that habit of, oh, I'm going to have it forever. And it's not. We need to treat them a little bit differently. But that also means we need to be responsible about how to build them, how to maintain them, sure. how to recycle them. Absolutely. Too. No, when I buy a, a, a Mac, I always get the Apple Care warranty, and then I sell it two and a half years in, so I have six months left on the Apple Care when I sell it to somebody. Mm -hmm. That that makes sense to me. So this iMac that I'm on right now, it's a 2017, is going to be sold before next year, and I have a 2016 MacBook Pro that I'm selling after NAB. Keeping it fairly NAB, then I'm going to sell it. Well, I mean, I, I actually don't sell my laptops and computers just because of the kind of stuff I do. Right. But my wife has great hand-me-downs. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, she gets my two-year-old computers. It's new to her. It's it's a dinosaur to me, sure. but it's something that works really well, and she doesn't have any complaints with it. Sure, absolutely. So I, yeah, I my have... problem my problem is I have to keep up both Macs and PCs because of what I do. Right. And, and so, so I have to have you know, like PC laptops too. And that, and it's like, uh, yeah, uh, those go dot, th those don't have as long a life as my Macs do. Right. The windows, the windows machines, I see them pretty much out of date about every 18 months. Okay. Have uh, they adopted Thunderbolt three at this point? Actually? Yeah. It's, it's, it's actually bigger in the, in the windows community than is in the Mac side now. Oh, really? Um, well, there's more Windows uh, computers, obviously. There's more. Well, that was it. And a lot of that started basically in January of 18 when Apple finally, you know, 17, when Apple finally settled on the Thunderbolt 3 and started delivering Thunderbolt 3 devices. That allowed the manufacturers to catch up. Okay. And at this point, at this point, there's, I think there's 260 some um, Windows computer manufacturers and, and PC host devices that support Thunderbolt 3. So let's talk about the announcement about Thunderbolt 3 <laughs> USB 4. So the question I have before we get started is, okay, uh, 2020 they say Thunderbolt 4, I mean USB 4 is going to be equivalent or the same as Thunderbolt 3. What about Thunderbolt what? 4? Well, is, is it yeah. standing still? No, no, no. It's okay. Not. Um, um, uh, let's see. How do I trip through this one without sticking my foot in it? First of all, let me say that the complete USB 4 specs are not out. Okay. They're not available. Gotcha. Not even a guy like me. Um, they're not even expected to finalize the, the USB 4 specifications until July, August at the earliest is what I'm hearing from from people who are knowledgeable on that. Okay. That's a, that's, that's months away. And Absolutely. then it's two years, it's two years to implement. Um, I, I did a quick thing for pro video coalition and went, you know, USB four versus Thunderbolt three. Um, the one thing you need, you need to understand about Thunderbolt three is it will work under USB four completely. Okay. And, and, and the thing that people don't understand is, is as a Thunderbolt user, all of that USB stuff works already. I get all of the benefits of USB 4. It's all already in my computer on my MacBook Pro. Okay. Um, I, I don't have to do any more. It, it's going to be compatible with the Thunderbolt 3 spec. It's also going to be backwards compatible to the Thunderbolt 2 and Thunderbolt 1 spec. I mean, I still have a lot of Thunderbolt, first and second gen Thunderbolt devices I do too. that I use. Yeah. And, and, and Apple's dongles are pretty universal for that. I will give them that. I work them on Macs and PCs with them. Um, I only have one Windows machine that won't worked a hundred percent on the Mac dongle, but it was a verse, but it was an early Thunderbolt three device. So it's like, okay. So they just didn't update the firmware and then talk to the manufacturer and they were because of the way they did it, they couldn't. So it would never ever be compatible. But the interesting thing about this is, is that now you've got the dongles, the, the adapters and everything are universal across all devices. And you have things like 
Um, I work with a Thunderbolt enabled monitor that powers my laptop. So I don't have two plugs into my laptop. I'm, you know, I have an Asus PAQ32U um, HDR monitor is what I use right now. Um, gives me 60 watts of power over the Thunderbolt connection. Plus I'm able to use DisplayPort and work at a 10 bit space. You know, I can choose a P3 or a 2020 color space so I can work in HDR directly from my computer while getting power at the same time. So this is one of the advantages about this whole Thunderbolt 3 USB that people aren't thinking about is, is that while you don't have a, I mean, I no longer have a power port on my laptop. Right. But what I've got is our devices that can actually power my laptop while I'm working with them. Right. And this goes back to that whole thing about what we were talking about with, you know, power over Ethernet and USB and all of these things. We've gotten used to the point of having devices that are interconnected with our lives. And now the fact that they are actually adding benefit back, not just storage, not just not not just connectivity, not just any of those things, but they're actually giving back power to me and, and control to a single device over a single port gives me more power, gives me more capabilities, gives me a better ease of use for the devices, whether it is a Mac or PC. I mean, sure. I, I don't I don't criticize people on which platform they work on. I don't care. I, I work on both for a reason. I have some applications that only run in Windows. Right. I have some things that, that render better in Windows, like 3D and, and some things I'm working on in that environment. But I'm still a content creator, and I still work on a Mac for that reason. So Now, I mean, tell me this. At least are they going to keep USB-C the port for Thunderbolt for USB 4? Yes. So that yes. won't change, thank God. That's okay. Um, that, that connector is capable of... Um, let me see. Let me put a conservative number on it. It's my understanding that connector is capable of handling 10 times or so the data that Thunderbolt 3 can put through it now. Okay. So it's future-proof for, for a while. So, 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 so you're looking at something not at 20 or 40 gigabits. You're looking at 400 gigabits you know, wow. for, for the capability through that cable. Right. Uh, um, that's the interesting part of all of this is that people don't understand that the connector is not the limitation. No, it's right. It's the ability. Okay. Well, and, and, and one of the other problems we have, and, and I can't say whether it's public or not, but, I mean, we don't have any Thunderbolt 3 long-run cabling. Yeah. Not. There's been, because we had to, they had to solve the problem of a power. Right. And how to translate the power from the end to end of that. Because, you know, you look at the, 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 the Sukumono cables or the, or the cording cables that I'm really familiar with. Their optical cables had no cable. There's no copper in them. It's an optical fiber optical, cable that okay. does transmission. that does either end. But how do we handle the supply issues for power that are required under the, you know, Thunderbolt and USB specs? Now we have to deliver power over those distances. So there, there's ways you have to get around that. Um it's going to be interesting when you start seeing those kind of cabling, that that kind of cabling change. And the price. Because now, now we're now we're not going to be able to have to you know put up with, you know, I have a rule of thumb with cables. If somebody tells me a cable is is X long, I usually think that I can get a good signal through seventy five percent of that length. <laughs> um, uh, Belden claims a hundred meters on on SDI cables. Um, I've never seen a twelve bit signal travel a hundred meters over a single cable without reclocking ever. I, I don't think it exists. I don't care what the manufacturers say. I keep putting, you know, sure. monitors and test things. Like sure. that, and I never get it. So in a world where we're trying to do 10 bit or higher HDR, all the cable runs just got shorter by 50%. Wow. You know, the 100 meter cable just got to be 60 meters. You know, it's 100, 200, less than 200 feet. Now, do you really need to run cables longer than 200 feet? Yeah, not really. Right. Most people don't have that issue. Right. And um, it, even running through walls and, you know, control rooms and all of that. And I presume those cables are active, right? Uh, yes, they would have to be. So, and for everybody who's listening, an active cable would allow you to get the full bandwidth and capabilities of, of the Thunderbolt. A passive cable will only allow the 20 gigabit um, data speed speeds and and usage on it whereas an active cable will give you at any length to give you the full bandwidth of the cable meaning i could get 40 gigabits or more of data plus plus the display port plus data protocols all traveling at the same time and that's a big difference in the cables on active versus passive right so, right so and, and i like the, but it was a good point because i didn't bring it up <laughs> right no i i know last time i talked to you you were telling me to check my cable and see if it's had Thunderbolt 3 logo, which it did, but it's yeah. a short little cable. 
Um, that's usually the right way then. So, yeah, exactly. That means that, see, and, and, and you get into that is, is that I, you know, and for everybody that don't, doesn't remember that the size of the boot on the end of the Thunderbolt three cable depends how far it can run. And the longer the boot is traditionally, the more active link, the better length the cable will have for active control. Right. Um, it's one of those little built-in look protocols that, that makes sense to people, but they don't think about it when they're looking at it. And and a true Thunderbolt 3 active cable will have the Thunderbolt logo and the number three written on it in color, in a color, not just stamped in the plastic. Right, right. And, and, and those kind of cables are, are, they cost more, they're shorter, but they do more things. So Right. So we're going to talk about NAB, but before we get to NAB, what do you think about this legacy media thing in Final Cut Pro. Is, uh, is that going to affect you? Is it a big deal to people outside you know, of Avid? It, 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 well, and Avid announced yesterday they were changing their dongle setup. I saw that. And it was like, oh, great. They're going to they're gonna go to a subscription-based system. Now, in the Avid world, subscription-based systems have only been for service, not for updates. Okay. Because Avid has a tendency to shoot itself in the foot with its updates, much more than Apple's ever done. Okay. Uh, so and people who run Avid systems tend to run them into the ground and they don't update them because it costs right. money because they work. That's, gonna, that's because that's yeah. because because they did one thing and only needed to do one thing. So um, yeah, that's gonna that's gonna change everything. Uh, as for the legacy media, uh, I I I archive all of my native camera content. So you know some of that's going to be an issue. But then a lot of the formats I work in weren't supported by Apple anyways. I mean, the Phantom Cine stuff has okay. never been – I mean, I've always had to transcode that in another application sure. and, and those kind of things. So that kind of stuff's not going to bother me. Um, I'm still going to keep Resolve, and, and Resolve is still a can opener. There you go. You know, a free application that's a great editor for all those Final Cut 7 people that don't want to change. And, and it's an application that opens virtually anything. Still or video, and that's what people don't see. I mean, I, I I was popping open files the other day. I was popping up ODT files, which are open desktop <laughs> things from no, notes and windows. We're opening up in Resolve right. because I needed them. Okay, Resolve opens anything. Except so, ProRes RAW. Uh, well. We'll talk about yeah. that in a minute. Let, let's stay. I'm going to try to stay on the legacy okay. media. So do you think it's a big deal? I mean, look, you know, Apple's been telling us, but the OS for 10 years, they're changing it. Uh, just recently, they've given us a year warning that Final Cut Pro is not going to open them up in the new update of the OS next fall. So that's a year in advance. Plus, from what I understand, Avid systems don't update their OS very often. They, they're back years behind. Yeah. And, and of all the codecs that I saw on the list, there were only three that really struck out at me. Okay. Um, uh, one was Airy Raw. The other one was the Phantom Cine codec. But the third one was Cineform, which was the only 3D codec that was compatible with, with Max. Now, they're going to take away 3D processing on a Mac just because of that. And, you know, there's still people that shoot 3D. I have a phone that shoots 3D. So, <laughs> so you know, I still, I, I still have a lot of content that I, that I actually acquired in 3D and I'm still working on that's going to require a Cineform deliverable okay. because it's 3D content. And, and that was kind of an odd one, only because of the way 3D has to be done. You know, you don't, you don't edit one and then go back and edit. You tend to edit eyes together, whether you see both eyes or not. You okay. edit both eyes at the same time. Okay. And, and, and that's an odd one for me. But that's not, but, you know, what it really means is, is they want to make the codec 64-bit, it'll work. You know, this is 32-bit stuff. We're trying to make everything much more efficient. Right. You know. The other thing that it does is it, it, it takes away a lot of the 8-bit limitations for H.264 stuff. It takes a lot of the legacy codec that was all 32-bit QuickTime that was, you know, questionable color spaces and everything else. We have a lot more control now. And and that's a little bit different for me. I don't seem to have a problem with that the same way. Okay. Because well, it seems I'm, like most people are not going to be affected. If they are, they're going to just transcode and get over with. But other people are saying they it's it's very it's bad for them i'm not sure exactly why it well, seems to be the avid people more than anybody well i mean and you look at the people who are complaining the most it's like why are you on a system that's still running 10 year old software <laughs> i mean why are you still wording a 32-bit quick time you know right. you know let's that 32-bit quick time was was phased out in quick time seven okay okay that, that's a long time ago <laughs> i mean that's like 12 years 15 years ago we started talking about phasing out 32-bit quick time 
So I'm, I'm not really, I, I understand it's going to put people out, but the reality of it is, is that you should have caught up by now because most of the codecs that they're going to uh, dismantle were used for the first generation HD stuff and a lot of SD and online things. You know, how many people use uh, 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 DivX, you know, right. <laughs> flash, flash. <laughs> yeah. Flash. Well, there was, there was a bunch of them, IMGs. There was a lot of things in there. That, well, the, the interesting yeah. thing is DV is still supported. HDV is still supported. But um, Avid, is it Avid or some other, some flavor? The of HD yeah. and, and, and regular MPEG. And regular MPEG isn't supported, okay. which is important. So it was like, we'll support these MPEG formats for DV, but we're not going to support these other MPEG formats. Right. Okay. No, I was surprised that DV was supported still. Yeah, that's from the nineties. It's a well, but there's still a lot of places around the world that use that. I would have I thought mean, it wouldn't have been. Is it thirty-two well, bit? Yeah, but standard definition is still standard definition. Oh, okay, that's true. And I mean, that's you know, and you have to think about it that way too. Is that there's a whole lot of of third parties, small vendors you know, third world countries, places outside of the mainstream that we think about that all have those. Education systems still use DV cameras to train kids how to be filmmakers. Okay. That's... Particularly in other, particularly in, you know, in out of the way places. It's not uncommon. Right. That's a good point. So what, before we get into NAB, what about RAW? I mean, specifically that I'm concerned about is ProRes RAW and Black Magic RAW. I mean, Black ProRes RAW is really limited right now. It's only, it only comes out on the Atomos recorders and the one DJI drone. Do you think right. that's going to change at this NAB? There's going to be an announcement with wider adoption or a wider distribution? Or uh, That's an interesting question. Um, it, you know, I, I think there's a longer-term benefit in ProRes RAW than Blackmagic RAW, only because of the way that Pro, ProRes has been marketed and accepted by Ari and Sony and Panasonic and everybody's um, that's a little different. And, and in that respect, I think that the ProRes, because it has the Apple name will actually do better in the long run. The black magic raw. I mean, everybody's up in arms about black magic. Um, you know, stop making cinema D and G. Okay. Cinema D and G was camera negative. You know, it was right. designed to be camera negative. It was, it was open sourced and abandoned by Adobe after they did it. Okay. It got picked up by Blackmagic at the time when the only other camera manufacturer that supported it was Silicon Imaging for their SI cameras that were doing really big in the early 3D days. And those were the only two companies that ever really supported uh, Cinema DNG as a, as a format. Um, the thing that la I laugh about Cinema DNG is the people who use it that don't realize it's a bunch of frames. They don't realize it's a frame-based code. <laughs> if you look at it in the finder, you can see that. Well, but they don't. They, they, they put it in and they pull the, the reference movie out and that's all they work with. They don't think about it and they don't look at that in that manner. I, I Having worked with frame-based workflows my entire life, I find them incredibly annoying. They're great for being able to do things like adjust frame rates or do anything else because you can go in and randomly right. pull out frames right. and you can rebuild things in different ways because you have each frame independently. But God, they're a pain in the ass. And, and, and they make for massively large file sizes and everything else. Right. Whereas these raw encapsulations give you that capability, that power in a simpler, cleaner, com more compact space. It's, it, it's e they're easier to work with. Right. They take up space. They, they record simpler. They play back simpler. I mean, uh, one of the things I've run across lately is I have a, a Fuji X-T3 I've been shooting with for about the last four or five months. I okay. love it. The, H.265, H-E-V-C encoding in it, will not play back on my Macs. Is that right? I have, to, I have to transcode it to get it to play back on my Mac in real time. Is that 10-bit? It's it, And it's a 10-bit codec. So I'm getting 10-bit compressed internally on the camera, recording to SD cards, but I'm getting a 10-bit space that's equivalent, if not larger, than the one that's coming out of the pipe as a live signal. Oh, well, that's interesting because the GH5, I, yeah. the GH5 it, records 10-bit uh, uh, H.265, and we can play it back on the Mac. Yeah, I can't play back. I can't play back the the Fuji one. It's huh. it. I've never get it. I've never been able to play it smoothly without adding a, an eGPU to the system. I'll be darned. So, the Windows machine all day long, but on the Mac, never plays in real time. Hmm. Well, I, I have problems. I'm I'm still on High Sierra. I haven't upgraded to Mojave yet. 
and it won't play 10-bit files. Uh, that's actually pretty common. Is that right? Uh, there's there's a couple of versions of the Windows OS, current Windows OS, that won't play back the 10-bit files at all. Okay. And and you get and people just panic over it because they've never seen um, uh, 10-bit files. And actually, a lot of times it's 10-bit H.264, not the 10-bit 265. Right. It won't play either the, the one. Ten, the 10-bit H.264 is nothing like even though it's part of the encoded spec and everything, there's something in the way that most cameras are encoding 10 bits and H.264 that no processor I know can handle in real time on the Mac side. I'll be done. The Windows machines, Windows machines can handle it all day long. The Macs cannot. Huh. But the but but the HEVC stuff, the H.265 stuff, I find very fascinating because uh, my camera is recording a 420 signal. Right. And and people go, oh, 420, it's not good. It's like, eh, PAL had a more better color space than NTSC for years in 420. It's just how that math sure. is done. And it takes a really beautiful signal. But I started running tests against what was recorded versus what came out of the, the HDMI port. Right. And, and literally kind of went, ooh, something's not right here. And started looking at it. It's like, it records a better signal internally than I get externally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so they, there, was a, there was a software upgrade to fix the problem. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. But, but – but yeah, I mean, you, you're constantly running into those battles on, on everything as we play with new technology. You're constantly having to fight through the little things that people don't understand that have to be fixed. So you, and, you mentioned DaVinci Resolve being a, a, something that opens up everything. What do you think about the editing app Resolve? Um, God, they kidnapped all the interface people from Apple. It's, it, it cuts like Final Cut Pro. Right. The only thing that people have a problem with getting into Resolve is the whole structure of making it you know, it's a um, um, because it's an SQL database. You have to import files to it. You can't drag and drop, um, and and that's the one kicker with the DaVinci Resolve that seems to choke everybody. I mean, I'm still learning Fusion. I, okay. I, I, Fusion was not one of my main apps, so I didn't ever play with it. So I'm still learning it. But I mean, what they've done with Fairlight and how it cuts, it cuts beautifully. And I mean, if you're a Final Cut 7 user and you want to feel like you're back in Final Cut 7, that would be Resolve for a lot of people. <laughs> and, and it's free, too. They can well, get it for free. Well, that's amazing. You can see with it, yeah. Yeah, so Grant Petty, they introduced, Blackmagic introduced a bunch of cameras a couple weeks ago. They introduced an update to Resolve, and he said something about there's going to be another update at NAB for Resolve. So is it going to be 16 or is it going to be 15.5? I, I, yeah, uh, NDA's up though. Yeah, I, I, probably, I'm, <laughs> I can't say. I'm not under NDA. I'm presuming it's going to be resolved 16. That, well, it, 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 that would be the logical thing. I think what they're going to do is, is we haven't seen everything that Black Magic is going to show to put out the show. Right. And I think that's that's going to be one of the other things is, is that I mean, God, even today, Harry released the LF, the LF Mini. I saw um, that. So tell me about that for a minute. Why, is that that's a lower priced Ari? No, 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 not at a lower price. It's actually a really expensive, Ari, because to make that camera that small, they have to they, they have to like redo everything, including an entirely new capture system for codecs. Really? So they came up with an entirely new, smaller form factor capture system that from the size of it, it looks like it uses the uh, um, uh, the same kind of, you know, high speed data storage that we use in a lot of our SSDs um the mmb stuff but it's it's interesting but it's basically the size of an alexa mini now it's basically the same weight um uh the sensor is twice the size or two-thirds the size um uh, two-thirds larger than that so it gives you that you know that wide format this division kind of feel the, the the feel that people got working in dslrs that we walked away from in film a long time ago because transport for film has always been smaller than sure. 35 minutes for film sure. um um, and, and as guys started working on DSLRs, people started wanting that full frame look because that was what we were used to. They didn't know that that process had been there forever. You know, there's always been that look. You could do anamorphics and get that look. You could do those kind of, you know, the shallow depth of field, you know, bokeh of the, of the lenses, this kind of thing. So it's, it's interesting that people don't think about that kind of stuff. So and, you were, and, you were, optics at, optics. You, were at the, you were at the very beginning of when Final Cut Pro first came out, you were founding one of the first four Final Cut Pro user groups. I don't know if people still remember that. They, Final Cut Pro 7 users do, but perhaps Final Cut Pro 10 users yeah. don't. Yeah, I mean, they forget that at one point there was this massive number of user groups. Um, you know, every, everybody knows the, the Michael Horton's does a Lotsie pub. Right. But, you know, in, in the beginning, it was him and I and, and 
Kevin Monahan in, in San Francisco and Dan Berube in, in Boston, and I was here in Chicago. And those were the four original groups. I mean, we all formed within weeks of another, 18 years ago, nine, going on 19 years. Um, and, and it was interesting because people didn't think about that. And, and I had come from the user group community. I was a member of the Apple user group community already. Okay. So I had been and was, and was working as an Apple liaison to the user group community. Um, but it was one of those things that it's like people didn't realize how much people needed to get together then. And, and while the groups have changed names and, and morphed through various different things, um, you know, they still, most of them still re, get together on a regular basis. I mean, Chicago only gets together about six times a year now. Okay. Uh, I don't know if Boston's doing it anymore at all. Um, I know Michael just had his meeting last night in LA where they were doing a live music demonstration with Michael Cioni. I saw that. Uh, yeah. And, and, and that, and Michael Cam is talking about other things, but, but that's the cool part about this environment that is here. I mean, it's now 18 years later and we're still all friends and we still all have to share a sense of, of group togetherness and community over these kinds of projects. And, and Final Cut brought us all together at one point. Yes. And it helped, and, it, and it's helped us to create a new world that sees video a different way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, when you were involved in those days, did you, did you ever work with the Final Cut Pro team directly? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, both, both with them and then, you know, I worked with the manufacturers who were out building the things. So I, I was always working in the background with how things went together and how they were tested. Um, I, I uh, stopped being a Final Cut tester about version 5. Okay. Um, just because of some political stuff at Apple that they wouldn't let me, but because of the manufacturers I was with, I was working for the manufacturers. Right. So I still was seeing the betas and doing everything sure. and I was still being kept up. They just, uh, they didn't like my, I, I was a little too aggressive on the reply. And I mean, remember I was the guy who like came up and waved a big flag when Final Cut 10 say came out and said, Hey, look, this doesn't do shit. This is not a professional application. There, there's no way to connect a piece of hardware to this. All the tools you have don't work. This is does, you know, I can't output an audio file. You know, people forget when Final Cut 10 came, it basically, it, it, for a lot of us who were professionals, it was Apple doing this. Uh, well, no. well, the thing, the, here's the thing, though. You know, if you saw the documentary, I'm, I was a part of that with Brad Olson. Final Cut yeah. Pro 10 was not Final Cut Pro 8. Final Cut Pro 10 was a brand new application. Mm -hmm. Version one point oh, but but, but the I understand. Problem, you know, it, it's that they're trying to build a community of like-minded people, professionals that work around this, and they deliver an app that doesn't do any of the things professionals need. Like, no, no, I understand. I we I, I can't digitize content into the <laughs> into the application. <laughs> you know, it was, and, and in that respect, they they were looking ahead, but they they. They, you know, they slammed the door a little too quickly and they got hit in the ass on the way well, out. Well, everybody, <laughs> I think everybody agrees with that. Even Apple does at this point. They should have kept Final Cut Pro 7 around for another year. You know, it give, even given us. Oh, a see, but that's just as bad because we still can't get people to get rid of it. <laughs> I mean, we well, still have people complaining about Final Cut 7. It's like, well, I bought it all those years ago, but it's still going to work now in my new Mojave. So what am I supposed to do? Right. A new computer, update the OS. It's free. You know, I, I I laugh at the people who don't want to change to use the same tools that they've used for a decade. <laughs> no, right. But the the other thing the other thing is that Final Cut Pro ten point four point six is a lot different than Final Cut Pro ten point zero point zero. Worlds, oh, yeah. worlds different. But people, oh, no, 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 no question there. Yeah. That's not a complaint. Um, I still cut short-term stuff with that, and I still find Final Cut and Compressor to be one of the fastest tools for doing compression changes, you know, to convert files and things like that. Uh, far faster than than Adobe, um, you know. Adobe kind of got in a hole with me, and I, I I still use Premiere for some things, but it's kind of gotten harder and harder to work with it in a lot of places. Why? And Final Cut, fine, I just um, media encoder has gotten so slow as to be painful. Okay. Um, and that, that's that's the first one off the bat. Um, a perfect example is I convert all these H.265 files from my Fuji X-T3. It takes five to seven times longer in media encoder than it does in compressor to make the conversion. To just make ProRes. That's amazing. Five, five times longer to do exactly the same thing. Is that because they haven't updated it or optimized it? Well, What's... It, it's been updated. I mean, I'm, I, 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 I see regular builds on all kinds of things from them. Um, and, and it's just that I, 
on the shipping version of the software is painfully slow. Okay. Uh, and just for those kind of things. The other things it does very well. I, I mean, I still can't take I, – I still choose After Effects over anything else for doing titles and graphics. A lot of people do. It's, 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 it's an old friend. Sure. sure. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's like Photoshop. Absolutely. It's like Photoshop. I can, I can work so fast in Photoshop that people are stunned by it. I was like, but I've worked in Photoshop forever. Right. <laughs> you right. know, I started in Photoshop before it had layers. <laughs> really? Oh, God, yes. When you had to do everything with Kai Krause's channels. And you know, wow. sit and listen to Kai Krause talk about doing channels and, and masking and all this kind of stuff and versions of, of an application that didn't support layers. And I can't imagine not having layers in Photoshop now. Well, no, of course. Of course. Layers but, are important. But in all honesty, I, I still cheat, though. I still go back and do everything old school occasionally just because. And if I'm in a hurry, I'll flatten files and do it all old school just because I, I know I can do it that way. I'm comfortable enough with how, my, how I create that I can, I can do that. I'll make a layer copy and then do it all on a flat file and do it that way because I know I can work faster. That, that's amazing. That's what, that's when nobody sees my files. When no, other people see my files, when I know people are going to see my files, I do them right. I right. do it for myself. I cheat like everyone else does. Absolutely. So we got this thing called NAB coming up. So oh God, don't remind me. <laughs> this, this is like your 50th year there. Ah, uh, no, nah, I'm not that old. Jeez, I'm not even close to it. It is my 21st year speaking. Congratulations. I I, I get kind of stunned by that. That a guy like me who's been somebody who, you know, kind of grew up on the fringes of technology and all that kind of stuff. It's been someone that continually is able to deliver professional, knowledgeable level sessions at NAB after all this time. And, and, and I do crazy ones. I mean, we're doing low light photography and, and what color is your light? Because all lights are used different kinds of specifications. And, and uh, that was actually in association with AMPIS, Society of Motion Picture Television Arts. So I'm, you know, bringing up, I'm bringing up your uh, web page right now for NAB. So you, the first one you says in-depth low-light shooting strategies. Yeah. We're going to look at the cameras that were. It says there's a poor network connection. Gary will be back in a second. Reconnecting, there's a poor network connection. But anyway, these are all the sessions. There he is. There you're back. Oh, yeah. Okay. Don't know what happened. All of a sudden, this just dropped out it, on it my said, end. Oh. It said uh, poor network connection, but I, I was just talking. So I have your page up for NAB show. So the first session is in-depth, low-light shooting tech strategies. Well, and interesting because... Maybe I shouldn't bring the page up. It's reconnecting there again. That's weird. I'm just checking the connection. Yeah, I got a strong connection, 278 megabits per second. So anyway, Gary will be back in a minute. We're back. Uh, yes, let me just get you back here. Don't know. Yeah, I've only got your uh, audio, though, for some reason. You're gone again. Yeah. Fuck. That's all right. Let me just, it'll come back in a minute. You uh, I, I heard you. Okay, can you hear me now? I have your audio, but I don't have your video for some reason. Let me see if I can, wait a minute, let me do this. No, that's it. Let me try calling you back, Gary. See if that'll work. So anyway, Gary, we're having a connection issue right now. I'm going to try to call him back. So let's see here. So in the meantime... Gary has all of these incredible sessions at, at, uh, at NAB this year. I'm going to bring him back up here on the page again while we're trying to connect Gary back up. Let me... All right, let's see if I can connect him back. I'm going to try. I'm going to quit Skype and then relaunch it and then... Try to call him back. I think that'll work. Let me just see here a second. Type a message here. Gary Adcock. Call 
all started. Let's see if we can get back on here. The unavailable. Please leave a message after the beep. Okay. It says you're unavailable. I'm not sure what's going on there. But anyway, so if you're going to, here we go. Answering your call, place your instant call and hold so you can message. There you are. Oh, you're on your phone. Uh, I got to go to my phone. I've lost all the wireless in my building here. Hang on one second. Let me get my headset on. Okay. Right too. But but yeah, it's I, I, for some reason all of my wireless is is out now. So let's see how that works. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, and I can see you both. <laughs> okay, we went on. We, we we turned that off. I went on regular old. Uh, uh, cellular connection for this so you so you get me a little different look now yeah, i have I, no idea it's, I had, it's like everything in the building went down because i just saw heard somebody yelling in the hallway about it too so we yeah, probably yeah. lost cable in the whole building <laughs> i've had that happen multiple times one time patrick southern and i were getting ready to go on and right before we started my internet went down but it, <laughs> this is Com, this is finney comcast 10 minutes later he was back up again well, yeah, of course. So, uh, so I get this hat thing going in my head here. So, but but um, back to what we were talking about on just the technology and that. See, where were we? We were talking about NAB and your and low your... light, low light. Okay. Yes. So, so the interesting thing about all this is, is like you know you don't think about all the cameras that are involved anymore, and and what we've got is is you know you've got Sony Venice, you got the Panasonic Vericam that are you know five thousand ISO. I got a chance to play with the Canon ME20H. Now, this is a camera that goes up to 4 million ISO. Wow. And they gave me one, and I was able to shoot, and, and I basically uh, did a running shot in Chicago an hour and 20 minutes after the sun went down, facing the sun, and then went and shot, showing and ramped up the ISO in this camera, and found out that I really liked like 30,000 ISO in this camera. That's incredible. That was just that was just stunning. And I mean, you're shooting an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes after the sun goes down, facing the setting sun. So I'm facing west. Right. And I can see in the buildings, I can see down alleys, I can see everything with texture and light inside each one of them. And it was stunning to me how incredible it was. That is and, incredible, and, yeah. And I was just blown away by a camera that basically shoots in the dark. That's and amazing. That. Yeah, it, it was stunning to me. So, you know, you, you you take those kind of things and just be able to do it. But it's just, this is done, I'm doing with Blair Paulson so that we can show people the kinds of things that are happening now. I mean, in the old days, I was lucky to work with ISO 400 film. Right. You know, that that was that was that was great. You know, I, I grew up in a Kodachrome, man. It was ISA 25. So right, it's like, right. you, know, you know, and people don't think about what that means. But now we have cameras that are, you know, most of the cameras now have a base ISO between 800 and 1250. Right. That's that's, right. Unheard, that's unheard of. Right. Now we're talking about 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 or more. And what about and, what about the dual ISOs? How exactly does that work? Well, and it's interesting. Basically, they're 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 just controlling how the light um, lands on the sensor. Okay. Um, um, one of the things that's really interesting in the whole process is how big the mask is on the sensor. Each the mask around each individual photosite. Okay. So there's a there, there's there's a photosite, and then there's a frame around it that collects light, and pushes it in. Um, uh, Panasonic uses an analogy of if it's a tall, tall, thin cylinder, the light fills it up faster than a wide, broad one. Okay. Well, but the reality of it is the wide broad one is shallower, so it fills up faster. And it's you, you get the ability to do more with it. And these really big photosites that allow a lot of light also enlarge really well. So if you have a photosite that allows a lot of light in, it actually scales upwards for you know conversion processes. Because okay. mostly because the Canon camera only shoots 1080. It's not a 4K camera. Because the photosites are four times the seven, I think it's seven times the size of the ones on the sensor in the C300 Mark II. The the, the photosites are seven times larger. Oh, okay, okay. So they're that much larger. The in the you know they they hold that much more light. Um, liken it to a high speed lens. You know, um, a, 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 an average speed lens that's got a you know a two nine or something like that aperture has got a pretty small front element on it. Right. Whereas if you go to a lens like a Noclux, which is a 0.95, it's all glass. You have this giant front element. So the bigger that element is, the more light comes in. It right. works the same way with photosites. Okay. 
And, and, and it's just an idea to give people at least it's like the next session on the list, which is what color is your life? Right. And people don't understand that, that, you know, the discount, low cost LED fixtures they get are not designed in our world. And, and if you combine them with low light, I'm working in low light with a fixture that's not designed for what I made it for. Gee, what's the first thing that green spikes going to show up in? It's going to show up in the skin tones in that low light shot you did the night before. And so I, I tie these things together in kind of a continuity. It's just so people understand that, that everything around you affects what you do. And there's a push that I'm part of through the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences for uh, spectral similarity index, where you're literally now, um, uh, uh, you know, trying to match things electronically across the board. Okay. Whereas, whereas LEDs use CRI for testing and color rendering index is a guy in a room deciding whether it looks good or not. <laughs> I, I mean, there's 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 no mechanical process in it at all. Right. And then the the, the TLCI TLSI is the the television version that the British did, but that's based around Sony and LDK and and Ikigami broadcast cameras and doesn't really cover cinema stuff. So the the the, the technology is very skewed towards broadcast centric stuff. And SSI, much like the Academy Asus for color science, is starting to allow color science to be brought to lighting too. It's very, very important for us for the future. Absolutely. Then your third session is innovations in AR, VR productions. I've got people coming in from all over. We've got um, uh, uh, some guys coming in from 360 Productions in Seattle. I've got a, um, uh, Adrian Ashley, who built an app called Lolly that blockchain protects women on dates. But she's doing a lot of stuff with these innovations with how to use augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, and and how to use that going into the future, and how to monetize some of that. Um, uh, Tuesday, the next session is wireless. I mean, we were talking. We started on wireless, and it's, it's this whole thing about how wireless confusion and and what's available in the wireless community, particularly on set, to be able to control things. It's right. it's a complicated process. I can't tell you how many times I've been working on set, and all of a sudden, all my wireless goes down because a fire truck went by, or a train goes by on the same frequency and just blows us off the air because there's no restrictions to it. Or conversely, I'm working on a sound stage, and the people in the next sound stage use a different kind of wireless system that's not regulated by the FCC, and all of a sudden all my stuff goes down because they're not following the rules. <laughs> and, and you don't think about things like that, but it happens. It happens a lot. It happens more than people think it does. Um, the last one there, the innovation session, um, we're, we're talking uh, – a woman by the name of Alexander Husnot is coming in from, from the UK to come talk about – just the monetization of AR and VR and how to find that. And with us at that session is Michael Mansuri, who's from Radiant Images. Okay. So you got the people who build the technology and the people who are talking about the next generation of that technology all at the same time. And that's that's the fun part about my job is I get to mix all this up. I get to bring the people doing the technology and the people working with the end source of the technology and get them in the same room so people understand some of the issues. Sure. And And, and that's important because it's constantly changing. Even for me, it's constantly changing. Have you seen any kind of an increase in AR and VR over the last couple of years, or has it kind of stayed the same, the interest in it? The interest stays the same. I think you're seeing more in augmented reality for the last couple of years because of the, the capabilities that are possible for some of that, um, particularly as we start moving into, like I was talking about earlier with the IP technology. As we start thinking about having audio and video married at the end point rather than at the beginning and right. staying that way together. Um, if we think about marrying audio, video, and ancillary metadata at the endpoint, at the user point, we now have the ability to then start controlling a way different kinds of media to the person. I mean, with augmented reality, it would all be based on where I am and what I'm looking at, and I'd be getting information based on that setup. And that's pretty important when you understand how people work. And, and being able to do all of that and be able to insert ad space or information or real-time data or anything else in your visual stream or in your, your, your metadata stream while you're doing something becomes more and more important. Okay. You know, you think, and you look at the other sides of that. It's, it's, you know, it's emergency warnings. It's, it's sales. We can get you the new product. It's <laughs> finding information on this thing. I mean, then what all drives everything is how do I interconnect? How do I connect with people? So being able to deliver people while they're doing something at the time they're doing it is actually pretty important. So, and then, and then we're talking about AK. AK. Ah, I got some friends in for that. Um, uh, Blair Paulson's coming in. He's one of the original 4K ninjas. He's been helping me with NAB for a few years, and he's he talking in that. And, I, and the, one of the other pieces of 
One of the other people coming in is Philip Grossman. Now, Phil works for Imagine Productions, you know, the big, big broadcaster thing. But what he does on the side is he goes and photo- photographs radioactive sites. So he's known as the Chernobyl guy. What? And and he, he's, he literally just thought about the fact that that, you know, I want to be the person that does this. And he he's uh, seven days ago got done videotaping Fukushima for the ninth anniversary for a documentary that's going to come out on the 10th anniversary of Fukushima. So he was in Fukushima filming on the anniversary on last week or now, two weeks ago. I presume that the radioactive level is way, way down. Right. And he wears a decimeter and he's done this. Right, in, I mean, right. he's done this in Chernobyl and other places. He's a professional. He's, he doesn't glow in the dark. Yeah. He, we laugh about it. He always carries these dose meters with him. Right, right. And it's like he, 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 he laughed. He got out of Fukushima with less radiation than he would if he'd gone ahead and had the chest X-ray. There you go. <laughs> and, and that's how you think about it. You have to look at how those kind of issues is. But, he, but here's somebody who's done this. I mean, he hikes for, uh, you know, deep into the dark through the, you know, the Russian forest to be able to get into Chernobyl, which is still a locked off zone so they can photograph things. And, and it's pretty incredible. He's done a bunch of uh, th- um, uh, he's done a, a Discovery Channel network on and he's done stuff for the Space Channel and some other things. It's actually very fascinating to have a guy like him come in and talk. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> and then you're, then you're doing something on food, the modernist cuisine. I'm only, oh, I'm only kidding. I know it's not. Uh, actually, actually, the, the cool thing is I'm I'm going to stand back and let somebody else do that one. I get to go up and do introduce my friends at Modernist. Um, they're a scientific. It's a think tank that that shoots food. Um, they have a couple of catalogs. They actually have a, a retail store in Vegas to sell the prints that they photograph. Um, uh, wow. It's owned by Nathan Nathan Murfold, the f- former CTO of, of Microsoft. Um, it's his. It's one of the properties of of Intellectual Ventures, his his uh, future development companies, and that. But they do crazy stuff. I mean, they do they work with lasers and all this crazy stuff. And and they're known for a, a cookbook called Modernist Cuisine. Okay. So it's a it's an eighty pounds, sixteen hundred page um, cookbook, for lack of a better phrase, that kind of set the world on end because it's it's the preeminent you know reference manual for chefs. <laughs> right. Right. And, and they do cool stuff and, and they have labs and tech and, and, they, and they decided they'd come show it because food is so much a part of what people do. Why not show how some of the coolest stuff is done? Right. And then shooting food is a, is a skill in itself. Oh, God, yeah. The yeah. technique. I'm, I've been doing it for – I've been shooting food for decades and still not any good at it. Right. So. <laughs> well, I make my living at it. I make my living at it at times, you know, shooting right. food for packaging and stuff. So it's like I know how to do it. But it's still one of the most complicated things I've ever worked on. Okay. So. And then we're talking about Red's Hydrogen One. What do you think about yeah. that? See, I, um, I think it's to open the discussion on what's being what's going on. Now, to preface that by saying it, it says it's a media machine or is it a, just a smartphone or a media machine? And you go to Tuesday night of this week, Sal, uh, Samsung paid The Tonight Show to go shoot the entire specials package for The Tonight Show on a smartphone. They so did? Tuesday of the Tuesday of this week, two nights ago, okay. that we shot. They they photographed on a Galaxy S10 smartphone. They did all the all the feature bits for the Tonight Show. Wow! Not the live in the studio, right? But all of the feature bits on a smartphone. That's amazing. I didn't even realize and, they did that. And when you talk about the way technology is going, and you look at you know news. You know, anytime you see something in the halls of of Congress or something, you see it's it's 300 phones stuck in somebody's facing for audio, for video, for everything else. Right, and I think right. this movement toward away from bigger cameras into small portable systems is viable. Um, Hydrogen is an interesting one. Phil Holland, you know, the great ACAD guy is helping us. But we've also got a woman coming in who's a visual expert. It's Sally Ann Miss, uh, Massamini. Um, she's from Los Angeles. She actually did the first a film project on hydrogen and her and Richard Crudenola got together and put a company in, but they actually are going to show their first film shot on hydrogen um, last year that we're going to, because it's, it's interesting. I want people to understand that phones are not just for phones anymore. We do too much with them to not, to ignore them as a source for broadcasting. Oh, I agree. I agree. You know, you know, and I mean, I switched to my phone here when my laptop stopped working because of the wireless connection. Right. Because I knew my phone would work. Right. Exactly. That's how much we have to think about those kinds of things. And, and and we take advantage of them all the time. And that's that's where all of this is going is people need to understand that the, the world around us is changing regularly. And if we're not keeping up, we're going to get left behind. No, absolutely. I used to shoot with a, a much bigger camera 
coming up. But then now I'm, I'm spoiled with the GH4 and the GH5. Now I love the form factor of the DSLR, or the, it's actually a mirrorless. I love it. Yeah, that. I'm, I, I'm not. I, I'm not enamored with them. I'm a, I, you know, I still have still cameras that shoot film and things like that. Sure. Um, I, I, I like motion picture cameras to be motion picture cameras for a reason. Um, uh, but I do. I shoot a lot of stuff with my X-T3 because it's so useful. It's so usable to be able to do those kind of things. And I love it for that aspect. Um, it, it's interesting, though, that, that, that I still – I've done a bunch of projects. I'm going to actually show a food project I did for a local Chicago restaurant where I shot on my hydrogen. Okay. And, 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 and because I think people need to understand that it actually – particularly with some of the tools. I work with Filmic Pro. Um, right. an application for it and it's like oh my god it changed the way i worked on my android phone you know it became easy to use i didn't have to fight with it i could you know i've got i've got uh, focus controls on one side and, right. and aperture and, and lighting controls on the other side i could just do my thumbs and and i can take pictures with it and it works amazingly well um it's not going to replace my iphone as my my handheld right but it damn sure i damn sure carry my hydrogen around as a secondary camera all the time and it's not too big, right? It's like a phone sized. It's it, it's 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 bigger than my iPhone 10 because I didn't get a plus. It's about the size of a plus, but okay. it weighs a little bit more. But that reminds me that it's a phone and makes me work with it differently. Right. It's a little bit bigger and a little bit heavier, and it's a little bit more difficult to work. And because of that size, I actually it feels more like a device to me because of the weight. Right now, do you what are you looking for forward to at NAB besides your sessions? Obviously, is that going to occupy most of your time, or you have time to go around? And... Oh, I'm I've got a lot of time to go around, and and you know, there's things like uh, the the uh, faster together stage Tuesday night. It's a bunch of things Tuesday night. Right. The faster together stage Tuesday night uh, is going to be real interesting. You know, there's a and there's a a party later on that night by one of the manufacturers or one of the the big retailers um, that's actually going on after that one. Um, it's a, it's a big time. There's a lot of stuff going on. I expect to see a lot in large format glass. Um, I think big lenses are going to be a, a big part of this. And I know from another manufacturers, um, the mini LF will be a very popular thing on the show floor. There'll be a few of them. Um, I, I mean, I expect to see a lot of stuff on IP video. I see, I like to see a lot of stuff right. on collaboration in cloud computing. Well, well, I'm not sure that cloud is for everybody, particularly, you know, on the front end of the food chain, it's kind of tough. Right. But for, for facilities in that, I think cloud computing is, is definitely possible just because it's, it's a way to be able to share and communicate. One of the other things that I think is really big is the communication aspect. You look at frame IO, you look right. at Ripster, you look at those people and how they're building the collaboration environments and how important that is to this whole, um, distribution of knowledge and capabilities along with, you know, disembedding audio and video or disembedding right. facilities and, exactly. and, and control rooms and everything else. We have to take it to the nth degree by separating all that out. So that, that changes all of us here. But those are the big ones. I mean, there'll be camera stuff. There'll be batteries. There'll be new lights. There'll be stuff from everybody because there always is. It's what's the one thing that everybody goes, ooh, and we haven't seen it yet, which is we're you know ten days out. <laughs> well, I leave for Vegas a week from today. <laughs> ten days out, and it's also tomorrow. It seems like. Yeah. You know. Well, I leave. I leave a week from today. <laughs> oh, okay. You're you're early so, then. You got you got your session start on Saturday, I think, right? Yeah, I start teaching on Saturday, so I have to be there a day to get acclimated, make sure everything's set up, and projection systems and all that. Oh, you do. Because do you do though, that ahead of time? You don't just walk I'm, in there. No, I don't just walk in there. Not when not when you're showing pictures. I not don't me. either. The AV guys I've worked with, the AV guys at, at the LVCC for ever now. Uh, I think I think we've had the same AV guys uh, for at least the last 15 years. They're union guys, so they, right? So they're union guys. So they know us. And I'm a union guy. I mean, I'm I, I'm a local 600. Um, um, and the they all know me. And they know that I'm going to come in and ask for certain things. And they actually, oh, Gary speaking. This is Gary's room. They actually, like, mark it off. And they all know me by name. They see me in the hallway and they talk to me because right. – I'm, I, I don't cause problems. I'm, it's it's not it's never last minute, and I've never ever raised my voice. <laughs> those are good. Those are all good things. Absolutely. Because because I treat people the way I want to be treated. Sure. I don't want to. I don't want to be yelled at. I don't want to have people barking at me. It's like here, this is my plan. This is when I need it done by. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. And Absolutely. It, and, and, and I never have any issues. And and they always check on me and everything else. And it's like you can't have. You know, that's the kind of stuff that you people don't think about, that you can't buy that kind of help. 
you know, that, that, that support you get from people you work with on a long term, that friendly nature that you deal sure. with. You don't you can't, you can't buy that kind of support from people. No, not at all. No, absolutely. I agree with you. See, so I'll be getting in there on Sunday and Sunday morning, and then I'll be going to I, I'm going to the content creation creators creation celebration future media concepts has a Sunday night. Uh-huh. Yeah. There's also the the ball, the uh, colorist ball Sunday night. Uh, the colorist ball, and there's actually two other things Sunday night. Too. Oh, are there? Okay. Uh, yeah. There's a there's um, Fujinon has a has a thing for the press and media. There's a, something else going on. I know Avid had something going on that night. I mean, there's a bunch of things going on. I do media too, so I get listed in some of the media. Right. Events, right. In, in addition to everything else. So I'm yeah. doing a documentary right now with Jeff Krulik, the guy that did Heavy Metal Parking Lot in. Uh-huh. And yeah. you know, and his brother works for Avid. I found out. <laughs> Krulik, I was gonna say that's a familiar name. Yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna stop and see him. I've never met him before, but I, I keep forgetting that his brother works for Avid. So he said he'll be there. So I'm gonna stop in and see him. Well, it's gonna be really interesting to see the show. There's it's a slightly different layout this year, and there's some companies there that have never been around before. Okay. Um. And and uh, you know, so it's gonna be interesting. But it, the thing to mean would be is if, see how much space is available in the back of the south hall or the back of the central hall and if there's more than a few hundred feet of space you can tell it start contracting last year it was you know it was pretty full but the central hall had a nice big open area in the back where there was nobody there and it, you could see the number of manufacturers that were falling away from the show and it's that's that's a very interesting aspect of it it absolutely yeah. is so I'm looking forward to it, even though there's not going to be any Final Cut Pro announcement this year, like there has been for the last at least last two years. Yeah. You know, Apple's not hey. Apple's not presenting this year, which is kind of a eh, whatever. That means they're just not ready yet. I mean, I that's well, yeah. I I I think I think what we're going to see at, at WWDC for the Macs, particularly the Mac workstation, I think that's when we'll see that and understand what it's going to be. Right. Um. You know, I, I hope Apple takes some some hints from the guys at HP who build their workstations that don't require any screws, that don't require <laughs> bleeding. You know, you can you can take an HP apart down to the basics and never pull out a screwdriver and never cut yourself. And, and I don't know if you remember the old aluminum frames, but I still have scars sure. from putting sure. PCI boards in and out of those damn things. Yep. <laughs> Yes. You know, you, you look at the inside of some Macs, there'd be blood all over the inside of them. And you tell somebody didn't know what they were doing when they were putting it together. Yep. Like, oh, man, why do you, 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 you didn't protect your hands? <laughs> no, absolutely. So are you looking for, what were you looking forward to besides your presentations? Are you looking forward to anything that special? You probably know some stuff you can't talk about. I, yeah, I have a bunch of stuff I know I can't talk about. There's there's four or five things that are going to kind of mind boggling that, that I know are going to happen. Um, it, actually, for me, it's really just about the people doing what we do. I mean, we're lucky enough to be able to to, um, um, you know, see our friends, have fun, learn sure. something new. I, I, I will always pick up new things. Uh, I mean, I got a call today on something that's happening at the show that I can't talk about. Right. It's like, oh, great. Right. I'm getting ready to go on camera. Can you like not talk to me about exactly. this? Exactly. Talk to you about it later. Yeah. You know, I get documentation of NDAs that I have to sign. You know, prior to the show, it's like, no, I'm signing NDAs after I do my live broadcast. <laughs> right. There you go. That's a good. <laughs> that's a good way to do it. That's. Perfect. I'm not signing any NDAs until afterwards. <laughs> Absolutely. So, but, how can but, people reach you if they want to talk to you? Uh, I'm online. I'm always online. Uh, uh, Instagram and Twitter are the best place to get a hold of me, and it's just at Gary Adcock. All one word. Right. Um, uh, my Facebook stuff, I kind of have to know you to be on Facebook, and I have limited my Facebook access because of everything that's going on. I actually don't even have Facebook on my phone anymore. Okay. Um, I, I carry it on my iPad and my laptop, but I don't do it on my phone anymore just because of some of the tracking stuff that I ran into when I started checking on files. And, I, and I'm good about it. So if they were tracking me and I turned all that off, right. I, I'm, I'm scared to see what, how they're tracking everybody else. Yeah, it, it seems so. to be there's somewhat of a division between people who are on Twitter and YouTube and people that are on Facebook. There's definitely a, a dividing wall between some of those people. They'll go on well, one or the other. They won't go on. Right. Well, and, and Instagram and Facebook are owned by each other, and I, I have the two accounts connected. But it's odd that, that you can't do it in the Apple OS anymore. You can't connect to Twitter directly hmm. anymore. Um, okay. through in Mojave. Okay. I, I have no, I have to copy and paste. I can't access Twitter from it within Safari at all. Anymore. I'll be darned. They, they don't even allow it. 
So, and I haven't figured out how to hack it yet. Somebody will, somebody, somebody will hear this and tell me, well, there you but, go. but it's like, that. but yeah, I mean, I'm, I can be found. I, I, I like being in front of people. I'm always available. Um, you see him on the street, stop and say, hi, I'm, you know, I'm a normal guy. I, I actually do. I'm not this crazy nutcase that hides in the thing. I actually like people and like being around people and like having fun at these shows. Absolutely. It's really important to me. That, yeah. It's all about people. It is. You know, Bill Davis, I've had him on a few times, you know, Bill. Yeah. And he said that the first four or five years he went to NAB, he was always concerned about things. And then he realized it's not about things, it's about people. Yeah, because the things will come to you after a while. Right. Somebody will tell you about it. You're hanging out talking to somebody. Somebody will have seen something. Absolutely. And, and that's always the way you find out the cool little thing that you hadn't seen is somebody else saw it and told sure. you about it. I, I, I mean, you know, I, I kind of laugh. There's a running joke this morning with the, the uh, you know, Airy released the new mini. It's been kind of a quiet secret for a few months in the industry. Um, I actually thought it was going to be released next Thursday at their event in the ASC Club. Okay. Uh, uh, or next Wednesday at the ASC clubhouse, but they announced it a week early. So fine. Um, but, but there's those kind of things. And it's going to be interesting to see what everybody else does and, and what you get from, you know, where are the display manufacturers, where are some of the trick manufacturers, right. what's the new slider technology? You know, it's not going to be, I don't care about drones and movies, you know, what's the new thing that I'm going to use for something else. Right. So, exactly. All right. Well, I'm I'm sure I'm going to run into you a few places there at NAB. Oh, you will, my friend. Absolutely. All right. Gary. Always good talking to you, Richard. Absolutely, Thank you, Gary. And thanks for having me on. Everybody enjoy it, and we will see you in Vegas. See you later, Gary. All right. Take care. Bye. There you go. There you go. So once again, I'll be covering things at NAB. I'll be reporting live. I'll do a lot of shorter videos live, more like behind the scenes. There's plenty of people that are covering, you know, all the normal stuff at NAB. I'm going to be try to cover the not so normal stuff, some of the unusual stuff behind the scenes. I'll probably start Sunday, I'll probably be getting in there Sunday, so I might even start at the airport. But the best way to be notified when I go live, because I'm not going to be able to post everywhere, is just subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com Richard Taylor TV. That's the best way. That's the be going to be the main place. I'm going to be posting on Facebook and a couple of other places as well. The Facebook group I have, Final Cut Pro Radio, is facebook.com slash group slash Final Cut Pro Radio. Some people don't like Facebook, so therefore, just subscribe to this YouTube channel, and you'll be notified. Click the little telephone. They have up there in the corner. That way you'll be notified when I go live. If you have anything specifically you want me to cover at NAB, once again, not so much the normal stuff. I mean, I'll be going to the Black Magic booth for sure. That thing is gigantic, and I'll be interested to see what they have coming out live because they, they've they already released some things, but they're supposed to have more things coming out. So I'll be curious what they have coming out at NAB. There will be some new stuff. Just subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's the best way to be notified when I go live. Automatically notified. I will be posting the links on Twitter. You can follow me at Richard Taylor TV on Twitter, at Richard Taylor TV and YouTube. And Facebook is my personal page is at Richard Taylor TV as well. But I will be, it is public, so you can just follow along there. I'm not sure how you get notified when I go live on Facebook. No idea how that works. I guess I could find out. So thanks a lot for stopping in here, everybody. Like I said, if you have any comments about what you'd like me to cover besides normal things, just post them down below in the comments section, and I'll look at them. But nor mostly I'm going to be trying to look for Final Cut Pro related stuff because that's, that's what I'm going to NAB for. We'll see what happens. I, I don't think there's going to be any update, but I think there could be an update to ProRes RAW. 
and I think there could be an update to the numbers that Final Cut Pro has because the last two NABs Apple has announced two time, two years ago they announced two million seats of any of Final Cut Pro. Last NAB Apple did a presentation and they announced 2.5 million seats of Final Cut Pro. So this year I would imagine it's three million plus, but there's no official place for them to announce it, but I think that might be announced at this NAB. It seems to be the place. I mean, you know, NAB is the biggest video production event in the world. There's none bigger than NAB, National Association of Broadcasters. So anyway, I will see you uh, starting on Sunday, NAB Sunday. Obviously, the convention center won't be open, but I'll be going to the uh, content creation celebration on Sunday night, and I'll be covering some of that. And Monday night, there's a party. Uh, LumaForge has a party, Faster Together party. I'll be there Tuesday night, fastertogether.com. Where is that? fastertogether.com. Go to there, get your tickets, and the discount code is jellyfish2019. You save five bucks. I've been told that does not work on the jellyfish itself. You don't save five bucks on the jellyfish. So I'll be doing maybe one more of these Final Cut Pro Radio TV Live events sometime in the next week or so. Final Cut Pro Radio, the next episode is coming out this week in a couple of days. Be sure to catch that. I think it's episode 82 or 83. I can't remember which. And once in a while, we have a Final Cut Pro Radio Saturday meetup. I get together some people. Every, every so often, we'll be doing those every once in a while. Once again, subscribe. Final Cut Pro, youtube.com slash Richard Taylor TV. That's the best way to be notified when we go live. I will see you all at the next live event that I do. The podcast, Final Cut Pro Radio, you go to fcpradio.com or subscribe on YouTube, subscribe in, um, sorry, iTunes, and that's coming out in a couple of days, the next episode, and I will see you all at NAB. Thanks for stopping by, everyone.